It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, along here with us, uh, Cindy joining us, is uh, Ella Phillips. Uh, Ella is our, one of our newest recruiters for Faulkner University. Raise your hand, Ella. And uh, when we finish today, she'll be uh, going back to the back. There's some materials that we've left you if you'd like to learn more about Faulkner and about Christian education in uh, this part of the world. Uh, she'll be sharing those things with you. Just a few things about Faulkner I share with the Bible class this morning. Uh, Faulkner University, the primary campus is in Montgomery, but we have four campuses, Huntsville, Birmingham, Montgomery, and Mobile. Uh, we have 3,092 students. Of those 3,092 students, 676 are traditional on-ground students at our main campus in Montgomery, and they have the full college experience uh, that includes sports, includes uh, the arts, includes chorus, uh, band, uh, eSports. That's right, you can get a scholarship for playing video games now at Faulkner University. I uh, also have a bass fishing team. We have uh, cheerleading, uh, other, other items there. More than, than half of our students are involved in some type of sports activity in their college experience. Uh, so we hope you would consider uh, Faulkner a little bit, but you need to know a little bit more than that. Uh, we have professional schools. Faulkner hosts the fastest growing law school, uh, American Bar Association accredited law school in the United States of America. Uh, Jones Law School on our campus has 341 students now. Uh, we expect even more uh, next year as that law school continues to grow. You can get a three-year or a four-year uh, part-time degree. Uh, in that school. It's so popular we have folks flying in from Dallas and Virginia uh, to the Montgomery Airport every other weekend uh, to attend the, the four-year part-time schedule and take most of their classes online. We have a College of Health Sciences with more than 440 students getting their doctorate in occupational therapy, physical therapy, uh, master's in speech therapy, master's in physician's assistant studies, and if our Alabama State Nursing Board cooperates with us in November. We'll begin uh, nursing school, bachelor's in nursing, starting in the fall of 2025. So that's just a little bit about us, but most of our students are adult online students or on-ground students at our four campuses. So if you know someone who didn't finish their college degree or get their college degree and they're an adult student, they can go online or on-ground. All of these programs have Christ at the center of their, their instruction, at their foundation and at their core. So I want you to know that there is a large, in some sense, but small, in other sense, Christian school affiliated with the Churches of Christ in Montgomery, Alabama, and it's worthy of your support. I want to thank you as a congregation for your support from many of you through the years. And it means so much to me as a new president. Been there two and a half years together with Cindy. And we're excited about what we're doing there in, in this place. Um, you'll see there the words, make your career a ministry. Since becoming president, the theme for our university is vocational ministry. What does that mean? That means that we encourage every student to have a purposeful education. An education where their goal is is to make their chosen career a ministry to serve other people. And whether it's a nursing student in the future, whether it's a law student, whether it's a business student or an entrepreneur student, a computer engineering student, a cybersecurity student, a criminal justice student, whatever that career is, whether it's an education, a teacher, whatever that career is, Make that career a way to serve other people. So that's what we're about at Faulkner University. And thank you for letting me make that quick commercial. Please pick up some information out there. Visit with Ella or Cindy and I. Glad to uh, share some more about what we're doing right here close by. So I want to, to share a lesson with you that's near and dear to me and I think very relevant. Our theme this year, we choose a different word every year, our word this year is relevance. What does relevance mean? It's, it's meaningfully engaging with what matters most. We live in a my truth, your truth world. There we go. That's the title. Let's go to the next. 
We live in a my truth, your truth world. It doesn't take long if you've got one of these for you to get an update or a news flash or some sort of notification. I got three on my phone right now. I haven't checked yet. And it's information that may or may not be true. Did y'all know that we're in a campaign season? Has anybody noticed that? Wow. Wow. You know, it was apparent to me when Cindy and I arrived late Friday night at, at, at Callaway, we, we took a little time this week. We've had a board meeting, two, two sets of days of board meetings, and a benefit dinner with Nick Saban, uh, where we celebrated uh, heroes of adoption and foster care uh, that night on Thursday night. It's been a busy week. We had to come over here and get a little respite, and it didn't take us long turning on the TV to realize there's a lot more TV commercials in Georgia going on about the presidential campaign than anywhere else in the country. Uh, you're, you're involved as one of those swing states, I suppose, and uh, there's a lot of information being put out, not just about politics, but there's so much being put out in the media, on our phones, that may or may not be true. So uh, how do we define truth? Well, first of all, have you heard some phrases uh, my truth versus your truth. Uh, have you ever heard someone one say, um, do what you feel is right? Or have you heard someone say, believe what you want to as long as you don't hurt anyone? Or you're okay and I'm okay. Or have you heard my identity is whatever I want it to be? Have you heard someone say, I'm not going to judge you, you don't judge me? Or whatever makes you happy, being happy is what matters. Being happy is what matters most. Have you heard someone say, as long as you are sincere, that's fine? Have you heard those things? Are those things true? Those phrases remind me of what Pontius Pilate told Jesus when Jesus told him, Pilate, I came to testify to the truth. I came to bring truth. Do you remember what Pilate's response was? He asked a question. What is truth? And that question is a searing question for this generation, more so than any other time. There are more people alive now than at any other time in the history of this world. There are more people connected technologically now than at any other point in the history of this world. And there is more deception by Satan himself than at any other time in the history of this world. And in the midst of that chaos that comes from the my truth, your truth world, it's so refreshing to live in a world of truth to live in a truth world. So what is truth? Well, let's talk about some of these things. What is truth? There's one God. Do you believe that? Say it with me. There's one God. We can do better. There is one God. God created humans with a soul. Our souls live after death. Although we deserve punishment for our sins, God loves humans. He made a plan to save us from punishment. His plan was to send His Son, His one and only Son, Jesus, as Messiah, as one who was promised. Jesus took on our punishment personally. He was crucified even though he didn't deserve it. He was buried, and he was raised again on the third day. That, folks, is truth. That, Paul said, is the gospel in 1 Corinthians. It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. His followers are raised from death to live with God in heaven forever. And these truths are summarized by a phrase that Jesus himself shared. He said, you will know the what? Truth. And the truth will set you free. Say that with me. The truth will set you free. So how 
Do we share truth in a your truth, my truth world? How do we share truth? Well, let's think about how Jesus did it. How did Jesus share truth? First of all, Jesus knew the truth. Jesus knew the truth. If you're going to be able to share something, you've got to know the topic. You've got to know the truth, right? He also practiced the truth. There are a lot of folks that know a lot about the Bible. There are divinity schools, schools that started off as Christian schools in this country that are filled with professors that even teach Bible that don't believe it. They know the truth, but they don't believe it. If you don't believe what I'm saying, check out some of the writings of some of the professors on some of these East Coast schools. But those who know the truth and those who practice the truth because they believe it are doing what Jesus did. And then the third thing is he shared truth by cross connections. Now you're saying, wait a second. (laughs) Well, that's a new one on me. What do you mean cross connections? What we're going to talk about today is what I believe at the core of building faith and helping people who are confused, who are influenced by the untruths in this world to find the truth and be set free. It's cross connections. What do I mean by that? Well, share the truth by looking at Old Testament stories, those stories that we learned in Bible class, and connect them with the cross of Jesus Christ. And we're going to do that today with three Old Testament stories in just a little bit. So if we share truth like Jesus did, how did he know the truth? A little bit of statistics on the Bible are there on the screen. Did you know the Bible is not a single book that was written uh, you know, by a single person? It was written by multiple folks, and it took more than 1,500 years to write all the books of the Bible. Yes, and yet the Bible has one story, the story of God's love, grace, mercy, justice, and how he redeemed us by giving himself Jesus on the cross and promised us life after death, resurrection. That is one incredible, epic story. So share truth like Jesus did. What are some of the phrases that Jesus shared with us that were truth? Love your neighbor as what? Yourself. Treat others the way you want to be treated. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. I am the resurrection and the life. I am, or take up your cross and... Follow me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his what? Righteousness. Be faithful to death and I'll give you what? A crown of life. Wow. Folks, he spoke the truth. And there's so much power and comfort in those truthful words of Jesus Christ. I feel better already just saying those with you here today together. Don't you feel better? So share the truth like Jesus did. So how did he do that? He did that with cross connections. So again, that's taking that Old Testament story. Go to the next one. There we go. And connecting it with the cross. That Old Testament story connected with the cross. We know that Jesus did this because of what happened on the road to Emmaus. Jesus had been crucified. It was the third day after his crucifixion. His body disappeared. Word began to spread like wildfire. And Simon and one of his friends, uh, two disciples of Jesus, they leave Jerusalem and they're heading toward this little out suburb called Emmaus. And on the way, they meet this fellow in disguise, and it's Jesus himself. And Jesus said, what are you guys worried about? You look kind of downcast. And he said, they say, well, we were disciples. We were followers of, and students of this fellow named Jesus. We thought he was the Messiah, but he got crucified, and now his body's gone. It's the third day, and some of the women are saying that his, his body's missing. 
And Jesus, who's in disguise, he has some fun with them, okay? He says, um, don't you know that the Messiah should have suffered these things and then gone to his glory? And then he starts with their place, where they are, in their, their confusion, in their anxiety, in their turmoil that's coming from their faith being shaken to the core. And he starts with the Old Testament scriptures, Moses and the prophets. And he shares with them all of the things concerning himself that were in the scriptures. And then at the end, they stop, they have a meal, and he breaks some bread with them, and then they realize it's him. Their eyes are open, and their faith is restored. Do you feel a little bit shaky in your faith? What I'm about to share with you, I have every confidence it takes a while to walk from Jerusalem to Emmaus. It's about like walking seven miles, folks. Okay, he, I'm confident that what I'm about to share with you are likely some of the stories that Jesus connected with them because the only scriptures that were written at the time Jesus said this were what scriptures? It's the Old Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John hadn't been written yet. All right? So let's look at some Old Testament stories. Let's go from their area of confusion, go to the next, okay? And we're going to study Jonah, the snake on a pole, and the Ark of the Covenant. Jonah, snake on a pole, and the Ark of the Covenant. Let's go to the next. Jonah. I love the story of Jonah. One of my favorite stories in the old Bible. You know how Jonah was a prophet of God, and God told Jonah, go preach to the Ninevites. Well, the Ninevites, they were awful, okay? They were brutal. They had raided, raped, pillaged, stolen, and caused the Israelites to suffer. They were bad Gentile folk, and he didn't want to go. He didn't want God to show mercy to these people, these awful people who had brutalized his family and his friends. So what did he do? He went to Joppa. He got on a boat and he went to Tarshish, he thought, and God sends a storm. Okay. Now during that storm, some things happen. Uh, first of all, he was asleep, right, down in the boat. And the sailors came and woke him up and said, Pray to your God, okay? Does anybody, can you think of another time in the Bible where there was somebody asleep in a boat and there was a storm and the sailors woke that person up and something happened after that person woke up and the storm was calmed? Who was it? Jesus with the apostles on the Sea of Galilee. Isn't that interesting? So we have that little connection with Jonah, all right? So, it's interesting, they're, they're out there on the deck. Jonah tells them what's going on. I serve Jehovah. The sailors who are, who are pagans and Gentiles themselves are really scared by this. And Jonah says, if you want to be saved, you need to throw me overboard as a sacrifice to be buried at sea, basically, and be killed. And then God will calm the storm. And at first, they didn't want to do that. They rode hard. You know, they tried to get back to shore, but they couldn't do it. So finally, they throw him overboard. Now, I want to take a poll out there. All right, close your eyes so you can't see anybody. We're going to vote. Are you ready? Raise your hand if you believe that Jonah was alive in the belly of the fish for three days. All right, raise your hand if you believe he was dead in the belly of the fish for three days. All right. Most of us believe that he was alive in the belly of the fish for three days. And you can read the scriptures, and I think you can come to that conclusion, but I want to share something with you, okay? In the New Testament, when Jesus was confronted by the scribes and Pharisees, after he had been healing lepers, healing the blind, turning water into wine, feeding 5,000 people, the Pharisees and Sadducees come to him and says, Master, if you're the Messiah, 
Show us a sign. Now, the lawyer in me, I practiced law for 29 years, okay? The lawyer in me, if I were Jesus, I would have let them have, I would have been recited, I healed these lepers, I healed these 10 lepers, I healed this blind person. I, I would have said, what more signs do you want? That's what I would have said. But you know what Jesus said? He said, you know, an evil generation, adulterous generation, they seek for a sign, but no sign will be given them except for the sign of who? The prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days in the belly of the fish, so must the Son of Man be where? In the three days in the belly of the earth. And the people of Nineveh who repented at Jonah's preaching after he was spit up by the fish on the shore, they're going to rise up and judge this generation because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. Jesus was getting into the face and into the minds and into the hearts of these Pharisees and Sadducees because they knew the story of Jonah. And if you read Jonah chapter 2, as Jonah prays from the belly of the fish, and that's why we all think Jonah was alive, because to be able to pray to God, you got to be alive, right? But in that prayer, which takes, if you read it at a pretty quick clip, takes about 35 to 45 seconds, okay? And I can hold my breath that long. I don't know about you. If you read that prayer, it says that he went down to death. And that word death is the Hebrew word sheol. Do you know what the Hebrew word sheol means? Folks, sheol is the realm of the dead. According to Hebrew folks, that's where dead people lived after their physical bodies were dead. So, this isn't from me. A really smart preacher shared this with me years ago that if we look at this, perhaps Jonah died in the belly of the fish because he was in Sheol. What did Jesus say to the thief on the cross who said, remember me when you come into your kingdom? Jesus said, today you'll be with me where? In paradise. Jewish folks believed that there were two areas of Sheol. And one of those areas was paradise. Where did Jesus go after he died on the cross? Did Jesus die on the cross? Yes. He went where? To paradise. And the thief was there with him, the repentant thief. Okay. So Jonah may have died. Whether he died or not, we know he was in the belly of the fish for three days, right? And what happened on the third day? The fish spits him out. What happened on the third day with Jesus? He came out of the earthly grave, okay? Jonah was spit out from the belly of the fish, and Jonah walks into Nineveh. There's very little in the book of Jonah about what Jonah specifically said he taught the people. He said, you know, basically in 40 days repentance needs to happen because if you don't repent, the Lord's going to destroy Nineveh. That's all he records. So that's not a very convincing sermon to me. But if somebody says when he's asked the question, where have you been, Jonah? <laughs> I was trying to get away from you guys, but God told me I had to come here and preach to you. And by the way, I've been in the belly of a fish for three days, and now I'm here with you. Now I'm listening if I'm an Ninevite, okay? Particularly if it smells like a stinky fish, okay? So Jesus said, no sign will be given you except for the sign of the prophet Jonah. Jonah foreshadows Jesus. Jonah foreshadows Jesus' his death, burial, and resurrection, then some of the scribes and Pharisees, go to the next, answered, um, Teacher, 
we want to see a sign. He answered and said to them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. No sign will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Go to the next. Jonah foreshadows Jesus' death and resurrection. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. Go to the next. Jesus was resurrected. He, was, he died. He was buried, and he was brought back to life. Now, before we go to the next slide, there's another story I want to share with you. What I just shared with you about Jonah, it's in the book that I brought here. Out there next to the coffee table, as you walk out on the right, there are books that Cindy and I have already paid for. Uh, it took us about 10 years to write them. It's a Bible study book. Would love for you to, to share in that. Um, we don't ask anything of you other than to make a donation to Agape of Central Alabama for adoption and foster care. And if you'll make a, a, a gift, there's a little can, you can put something in there. You can take one of those books with you. If they run out on the top, there's a box of them on the side. Uh, so that's in this book. The next story I'm gonna, we're going to talk about is not in that book. It's in book number two. I'm about two-thirds of the way finished with it, and something happened. I became a college president two and a half years ago and hadn't quite got around to finishing it. But we're determined we're going to finish it. So I want to ask you a question. We heard the scripture that was read this morning, John 3, 16. Let's say that together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. Good. All right, now let's quote the two verses right before that. John 3, 14 and 15. Are you ready? Here we go. We don't know those verses right before it. John 3, 14 and 15. Here it is. For as Moses... Jesus is talking, lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. Then He says, for God so loved the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. Folks, we've heard John 3, 16 all our lives. This afternoon when we watch... Uh, uh, NFL football, if you watch that, there'll probably be a sign out in the audience, right? John 3, 16. Some athletes put it on their, their blackout under their, their eyes. John 3, 16. And we have preachers all over this country and all over the world saying, all you have to do is believe. Uh, and just John 3, 16, that's the gospel in a nutshell. And we don't know what Jesus himself said to explain what saving faith really is and what it really means in John 3, 16. And here it is. From the Old Testament book of Numbers, this is the story that Jesus is talking about. The Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. They bit the people so that many people of Israel died. So the people came to Moses and said, he, uh, We have sinned because we have spoken against the Lord, and you intercede with the Lord for us that he may remove the serpents from us. And Moses interceded for the people. Let me ask you a question. Raise your hand if you believe that God immediately removed the snakes when he interceded. All right? You're incorrect. I'm sorry. Next scripture. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a standard pole, and it shall come about that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, he will live. And Moses made a bronze serpent, set it on the standard pole, and it came about that if a serpent bit any man, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. So instead of answering the prayer when, when they called out to be saved, God didn't answer the prayer. He told Moses, go and make something, make a serpent, on, and, and put it up on a pole. And, and, and this standard pole there in, in the middle of the camp now... Experts estimate that the population of Israel when they came out of Egypt and had been wandering the wilderness for this period of time was around 3 million people. 20 years ago, that was the population of Atlanta, Georgia, 20 years ago. It's a bunch of people. And imagine they're all being bitten by snakes, and the reason they're being bitten by snakes is because they complained about food. Whenever my children complained about food, guess what story I shared with them? And we give them a little pinch. And it didn't take long 
until when I heard someone complain about food, I would say, hmm, do you want to hear the story about what God did to the Israelites when they complained about food? Okay, they were complaining about manna that God had sent down from heaven, that bread that came down from heaven. And so the Israelites, three million of them, they're sick, they're dying from snake bites. And there were three types of folks in the camp. Imagine the word going out across the camp. Moses made a brass snake, put it on a pole. If you want to be saved, go look at the snake. Some of the folks out in the camp, when they heard that, they would say, I don't believe it. If they didn't believe it, they stayed in the tents, and what happened to them? They died from their snake bites. Okay? There were other folks that said, I hear you, but I ain't walking all the way to the middle of the camp through a bunch of snakes and get bit again. You know, they're too caught up in the pain that they're experiencing from the sin to possibly mentally or physically endure getting out there and doing what it required to get to the middle of the camp to look at the snake. But others who believed, who got up and went to the middle of the camp, what happened to them? They were saved. That word for standard pole, it's a special word in Hebrew. It means a pole that has a vertical component and a horizontal component that holds a standard that hangs down from the horizontal component. So when Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. He was referring to His crucifixion on a cross that's in the shape of a standard pole. That's what saving faith is about. It requires action. It requires obedience combined with the faith, that full trust that going to the cross of Christ, imitating His death, burial, and resurrection that we do when we are baptized. We imitate Jesus' death. We die to sin. We imitate His burial. Or it's not in ground. It's in water. And His resurrection, which is when we come up out of that water, a spiritual resurrection occurs and our sins are cleansed. That's what saving faith is all about. Does that make sense? Think about it. We need to memorize John 3, 14 and 15 as well as verse 16. And finally, I want to share with you uh, some, another story from the Old Testament. And uh, if you'll go to the next... Now, as an attorney, i got to confess to you, when I looked for images of the Ark of the Covenant on the Internet, I was disappointed because all the really cool, beautiful images, they're copyrighted, and I have to pay money for it or, or get some special license to get it. But I found this one that I can show to you because it has no copyright with it. This is from Amazon.com. Yes, you can order this Ark of the Covenant replica jewelry box from Amazon.com, if you like. Now, it just shows the basic dimensions there of the Ark of the Covenant. And on the top of the Ark of the Covenant, there's two what? Do you see them? What are those two things? Cherubim. Two, two angels, two cherubim. And notice that they're facing one another. Okay? Now, if you look at the dimensions of the Ark of the Covenant that God told Moses to build, uh, a, a, a small person... Uh, and at the time, people were a lot shorter. They're not six, three and a half like I am, okay, back in Moses' day. Uh, they were shorter people. They can kind of get in between there. But that cherubim on top of that cover, on top of the Ark of the Covenant, has a special name. It starts with an M. It's the mercy seat. Yes, I heard someone say it. We've got some Bible scholars here in LaGrange, Georgia, at the church here at Broad Street. Uh, the mercy seat. Yes. And the scriptures say that God dwelled on the mercy seat between the cherubim and that invisible space between the two angels and that God spoke with Moses from the mercy seat. Okay? And there's so many scriptures in the Old Testament that talk about that mercy seat. But i got to tell you something. As an attorney, it also bothered me that we've got these two 
images, these sculpted, graven images of angels on top of the mercy seat, when there's something inside the mercy seat written with the finger of God, what is it? The tablets with the Ten Commandments on them. And one of those commandments is, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven what? Images. Now, as an attorney, I resolve that by saying, you know, in the law, there's always the law and, and the rules, and then there's something that starts with an E. The exceptions to the rules, right? And so for years, I had made sense of this simply by saying, well, God, can he's sovereign, he can do what he wants to do. He can have the Ten Commandments inside the Ark of the Covenant with a commandment that says don't make any graven images, and he can tell Moses to make a graven image of two angels on the top of it. That's okay. God can do that, and I, I, I was good. And then a couple years ago, if you'll uh, skip to, I'll tell you where to go. Go to the next. Go to the next. Go to the next. Go to the next. There we go. I came across this scripture. You know, it says, Now Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and she looked into the tomb and she saw two angels. And look at the detail where those two angels are. They were in white, one at the head and the other at the feet where what had been in between? The body of Jesus. God recreated the ultimate mercy seat in real life in the damp darkness of the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, where Jesus, the crucified Messiah, had been laid out. And it's because he is God himself. John the Apostle testified to it. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word... Jesus was... Jehovah God dwelling between the cherubim in the mercy seat. And it's Him who gives us mercy. If you don't get anything else out of today, I hope you just got a little chill like I did the first time I read what the Apostle John saw. And it's it's no coincidence, ladies. <laughs> it's no coincidence that it was a woman, Mary Magdalene, that not only saw this, but was the first to see Jesus. We all are one in Christ Jesus, called to Him, to boldly, boldly share this gospel of Jesus Christ. There is an opportunity for spiritual awakening in the churches of Christ like there has never been in the history of this country. We've come out of a pandemic. People have seen their friends, their relatives, their kinfolk die. Young people I've never seen it like this in my life. They understand that they're going to die. There is mortality. And they are seeking the resurrection. They're seeking the hope that comes that there is life after death. And if we don't speak up now, God help us. These scriptures give the powerful message that we can share. And I've given you three of them to discuss with your friends, your neighbors, and your kinfolk in the coming weeks. I'm challenging this church 
I'm challenging this church to boldly proclaim the gospel. In the book of Acts, Peter and the other apostles got arrested in the temple while they were trying to preach after they had healed this blind man who was begging. And the Sanhedrin took them and they threatened them. And they go home, and when they got home in Acts chapter 4, do you know what they pray? They pray, Lord, see their threats and enable us to boldly proclaim your gospel. Does anybody know what happened to the house that they were in when they prayed that prayer? The scripture said, it shook. Pray that prayer. And this church is going to explode with people seeking the gospel of Jesus Christ just like the church did in the first century. Y'all have been such a good audience to listen to me. Thank you for letting me go a few minutes over today. Uh, if there's anyone here that, that needs to obey the gospel, that needs to be buried with Jesus in baptism or needs to come forward and ask for the, the prayers of this good church, won't you come and won't you come while we stand and while we sing?